Welcome to Hamer Reviews. My name is Christopher Hamer and today we're looking at the second part of my solar installation videos and I'm mostly going to be focusing on the Solar Edge home battery, um, the sort of process of having that installed and my initial impressions as well as the initial output from the system and how it's performing. Um, but before we do that I just wanted to update you on a couple of changes since the previous video. Now you might have noticed there's been a couple of weeks break. Uh, reason for that is been a bit busy but more than that we had to make a few changes to the system as well. Now what had happened is that at some point in the process we'd got the pitch calculation of the roof wrong um, and as a result the system actually can produce more power than we'd anticipated or calculated. Now this is important because there's actually a maximum power limit for each string, so the, the um, solar panels that are connected one, one to another, um, that you can have. And in my case, because all 20 panels were on a single string uh, because of that miscalculation, um, it actually would have gone over the maximum that the inverter could handle. Now that's obviously not a good thing, so we split the string into two, north side and south side, 10 panels each. So there's now two sets of cables running into the inverter rather than one. Um, and at the same time, we also removed the DC isolators on SolarEdge's um, advice because they're not required due to the fact that SolarEdge inverters actually have a DC isolator essentially built into the inverter itself. Second, you move uh, the power switch over to stop it from producing power, it will actually isolate itself from the DC um, cables from the solar panels so there's no real need to do so so we've done that too. So those are the main changes but let's jump into the battery so oh, I'm leaning on it right now but the the actual installation of it was was pretty uninteresting if I'm honest and it's not a bad thing if it just works right um, there's a big sort of heavy metal mount that gets attached to the wall um, then there's the battery itself which gets um, basically hung off that mount and then it's sort of screwed into place and then you put this big plastic cover on. Not terribly exciting to video so I didn't, though I now regret doing that because at least it would have been some b-roll to put on. Uh, instead have a look at the inside of the battery. Um, but yeah that's sort of the, the main thing that happened there. Then in terms of connecting it up and actually setting up the battery it's, it's a pretty good process actually. I, I, I enjoyed um, how that had been set up. So two DC power cables uh, run across to the inverter uh, as you'd expect. And then you can either use Ethernet cable, RS458, um, to connect it up to the inverter so they can communicate, or you can use SolarEdge EnergyNet, which is a little Wi-Fi adapter that you can plug into your inverter, which will then allow it to wirelessly speak to the battery. That's the route we went because it was recommended to us by SolarEdge, um, and the system works pretty well. Uh, the actual setup was done through the SET app, uh, which is SolarEdge's app for installers. And to be honest with you, the commissioning process, pretty simple, and it just worked. Of course, after that point, we realized we had to make those changes to the system, but that was fine because once we'd done that and got the system back online, the battery has been functioning perfectly, and so has the inverter. In fact, a um, bit of a spoiler for what's coming up, but I talked in the previous video how four kilowatts was the max that we'd produced uh, at any one time and that I was a bit disappointed and I was kind of expecting it to be five. Well since we split it into two strings uh, we've actually had seven kilowatts. Now as an owner with um, the battery you actually don't get a huge amount of control at the moment in fact you get none. Now, I'm hoping that's going to change in the near future um, but if you want to change the profiles that I'll run you through in a second your installer is going to have to do that for you. It's a bit frustrating um, but I am pretty certain that that is going to change in the not too distant future. Now the profile that I have set up on my battery is maximum self-consumption. That is the default and it makes perfect sense to me because I do not have a um, off-peak tariff. I have flat rate, I pay the same for electricity whether it's nighttime or daytime, and it just makes no sense for me to charge the battery at night. So maximize self-consumption, produce solar, use whatever we're using in the house runs to the house, and then the excess gets sent to the battery. Now once the battery's full we send whatever's left to the grid, but the idea is to fill this battery up as much as we can. The net result is for a lot of the time I've been able to get through most days and nights without having to take any grid electricity at all. And when I have, it's only been like two to five kilowatt hours. That still sounds like a lot to a lot of people, I'm sure, but we actually have a hot tub running um, 24 hours a day. And as a result of that, nighttime electricity use is a little bit higher than I'd like. So this is an excellent way of um, evening out that curve and really minimizing the amount of electricity we have to buy from the grid. Now, one of the other modes that you can choose that 
I think will probably appeal to a lot of you is if you do have an off-peak electricity tariff, so your electricity is cheaper at a specific time, you can actually have your installer set that up so the battery charges at that time and then discharges outside of that time. So you've bought the cheap electricity in, you've stored it in the battery, and then you discharge, I use that electricity as your home requires it um, during the day. That's obviously extremely beneficial in the winter where your solar panels just aren't gonna be producing that much power, but it's something I'd probably turn off in the summer because obviously you're just not gonna really need it if your panels are producing enough power to charge the battery. Given we are now talking about um, the battery in detail, let's head into the studio and have a talk about the, um, you know, the power generation we've seen so far, how the battery's been working, and my initial impressions on you know, how the system's doing basically. So let's jump into some specifics with regards to how the system's performing and the role that the Solar Edge Home battery is playing in my setup. So when we had the system first installed on the 11th of August, or rather activated, um, we didn't have the battery hooked up. So we have about five days worth of data there uh, where we have the solar production. Now we didn't have the Modbus meter, which is why we couldn't install the battery. However, I do have a smart meter from Octopus, so I can actually track how much electricity I use. Now, before I had any of this switched on, my energy use on average was between 16 and 28 or even 30 kilowatt hours a day. As soon as we switched on the solar system, that usage dropped to between 10 and at absolute worst 26 kilowatt hours a day. Now that last number is high, but I think we had to have the system off for a little bit whilst we were installing the battery, which would account for it. And it was a very overcast day where we're gonna produce less power. But overall, we had a couple of days of only using 10 to 12 kilowatt hours of electricity. So that's already great. Now the system was producing 35 kilowatts on some of those days, uh, on Friday the 12th and Saturday the 13th. So we can clearly see that I was sending a lot of power to the grid. Now, we then had a week of downtime where we were adjusting the system a bit, and then the system came back online with the battery and solar system being split into two strings and producing loads of wonderful power. And we then had from the 24th midday onwards, we had some proper data. And that's where I think it gets really interesting because my energy consumption from that point forward completely shifted to the solar system and the battery. Specifically on, let's take an example, Thursday the 25th of August, it was an overcast day. We only produced 14 kilowatt hours of solar power. We imported only five kilowatt hours of power from the grid, but we consumed 10 kilowatt hours via the battery. So the battery had managed to get fully charged during the day. We'd pulled four kilowatts during the day into the house, but then during the night, the battery was taking that load off the house, or off the grid rather, meaning we weren't entirely self-sufficient, but we were a damn sight closer to self-sufficiency. And even if I look at some of the days that had higher production, for instance, Monday the 29th of August, I only pulled 400 watts from the grid, watt hours from the grid, and I consumed 20 kilowatt hours. But as I produced 20.3 kilowatt hours, I was able to run the house pretty much entirely off the battery and off the solar system. Without the battery, I would have been, as I was in that first week, pretty much reliant on the grid overnight where the hot tub's you know, heating up and so on. And I would have been reliant on the grid for cooking, etc. So the, I've shifted a lot of my usage away from the grid to the battery, which is the whole idea of it. Now, as I alluded to downstairs, in the winter time, this won't be the case because my system, as wonderful as it is, won't be producing that much power, I suspect. Therefore, if I were to have one of those off-peak tariffs, I could be charging that battery with cheap electricity. Let's say if you had Octopus Go, yes, I know you need an electric vehicle to have one, but let's say you have one and you take out the Octopus Go uh, tariff, you'd pay 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour during the hours, I think it's four hours, sort of around midnight till 4 a.m., something like that, ballpark. So you could charge your battery fully, plus your EV, and then rely on that power for a little bit during the day and cut your costs of running your home because rather than paying, let's say, 50 pence per kilowatt hour, you've paid 7.5, which is a huge difference. If I look at the data for September more generally, I think that's where it gets interesting because that's 15 days, so half the month, where 
the battery's been active and the solar system's been active and everything's been working as it should. It is fair to say that September was not like August. August was incredible. We had back-to-back -back sunshine, days with very few clouds. Polar opposite for September, the weather has been pretty awful. Lots of rain and lots of uh, clouds. And as a result of that, even though we had a couple of days where we produced over 25 kilowatt hours of power, most of the days we only produced between 12 and, oh no, even worse than that, between nine and, yeah, nine and about, 18. That was sort of the average. But even during that time, we've only had to import 17% of the electricity the house has used from the grid. That equates to 43 kilowatt hours. The rest of it has come from the solar panels and the battery. And in fact, 64% of that power has run through the battery. So to me, that's, that is where that value is in the battery. It's allowing me to make much more use of the power that I produce, significantly reducing my energy bills in the long run. So something I alluded to in the garage that I want to go into more detail on is how the solar red system is allowing me to avoid clipping and really make the most of my solar panels. Now, an example I have from last week is my system was producing seven kilowatt hours of power from the panels, but I only have a six kilowatt inverter. So in theory, one kilowatt of power should be clipped, i.e. disappears off into the ether, and unfortunately I can't make use of it. This is completely normal. As I said in the previous video, you want to have your panels have higher output than your inverter output because it's very rare that you're going to hit circumstances where your panels are producing their maximum amount of power. But recently I have had good conditions for it because we've had some spells of sunshine, cool weather, perfect. The panels love it, able to produce loads of power. Wonderful. So the system was producing seven kilowatts of power. Now in theory, as I said, should only have got six kilowatts and that's that. But because we have the battery, we were actually sending 4.5 kilowatts to the house. So we had, I think, the washing machine and the hot tub on and something else. So that was great. And we were sending 2.3 kilowatts to the battery. Also a tiny bit going to the grid, but that's sort of standard. That's sort of how the system runs most of the time. But that's still higher than the six kilowatts than the system in theory can produce. And I think that just highlights the benefit of having a DC connected battery. Now, I'm a huge fan of my parents' Tesla Powerwall. I love the, um, I love how much access you get to it, how you can change the settings. I think it looks great. It does look really sleek. I love the green light on it, etc. It's wonderful. But it's an AC connected battery. So the solar edge inverter that they've got is essentially converting the power, sending it to the battery or sending it to the house, but you're never going to get more than the 3.68 kilowatts the inverter is capable of. Whereas here in this case, I could have a situation where the houses, sorry, the solar panels are producing 7.5 kilowatt hours of power, which is the highest I've seen so far, which is utter madness given I've got an eight kilowatt array and half of the panels are on the um, north side and half are on the south side. But even then, I could send six kilowatts to the house. Let's say I have really high loads, maybe the washing machine's on, the dryer's on, the hot tub's doing its thing, and the uh, dishwasher's on, that's the, or maybe the oven, that uses a fair bit as well. And I could still be sending, you know, 1.5 kilowatts to the battery to charge it up. So that's, again, this is, I'm just trying to reiterate, that's why I really like the Solar Edge home battery and why I think that there's definitely something there. Now, there are other DC connected batteries, don't get me wrong, but having everything in one ecosystem, in one app, etc., is quite nice. I look forward to getting the control I want in order to make more of it. But my initial impressions, given it's the middle of September, the system's working really well. And in fact, I would say I'm producing more power than I expected, even on cloudy days. And overall, I've been so much less reliant on the grids and my energy bills have dropped significantly. Don't get me wrong, it is a big investment of money and you know the batteries can be extremely expensive. The Tesla Powerwall, for instance, will probably set you back over £10,000 at this point. You probably, I've seen as much as 11 or even 12 quoted, plus a wait time of six to 12 months. The Solar Edge home battery seems to still have better availability. They're not necessarily of all the parts, but it's also quite a bit cheaper. Should be able to get one installed for, you know, six to seven and a half thousand pounds in that ballpark. So it, it sort of is an expensive investment and you do need to do the math if it works out for you. But for us, really delighted by it, really able to make full use of the solar panels and even more than that, really able to reduce our reliance on the grid and with energy prices what they are, that's certainly a good thing. 
So hopefully you found this video useful. Um, if you have any questions, pop them in the comment section below. Are there any specifics you'd like me to cover? Uh, do pop those ideas into the comments. I always read them and I'll probably try and follow up with an additional video. This is part of a much larger series talking about additional videos. So I'm gonna be doing a full proper review of the solar edge home battery at some point soon. In addition, I think we can do a comparison to the Tesla Powerwall because I still have access to that. And there's going to be monthly updates, I hope, if not quarterly, on how the system's performing. We're gonna go through the graphs, we're gonna go through the energy production, um, hopefully we'll do one at the end of this month and then continue it monthly thereafter. It will just hopefully help you to make the decisions you need as to whether you want to go down the solar route and the battery route. And fingers crossed, it will help you make that decision. And in addition, we obviously have a north facing uh, solar array and a south facing solar array. So a lot of my comparison in those videos is also gonna be focused on that because I think that there's a lot more benefit to the uh, north facing array than um, even I had anticipated. So thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, please do, it really helps me out. And I do hope I see you again next time. Goodbye.